Welcome to the Arizona Department of Education's webinar learning experience that will be guidance for administrators and what to look for in a three-dimensional science classroom. My name is Sarah Sleesman. I am the science and the STEM director at the agency in the standards section. And my name is Rebecca Gorelli. I'm the K-12 science and STEM specialist at the Department of Education. Thank you, Rebecca. Do you want to go ahead and walk us through the resource that we'll be using throughout today's presentation? Sure. And so we're going to drop a link in the chat. And the link is actually a forced copy of a Google Doc. And so what you're going to do is click on it in the chat. And when you open it, it should look something like this. So take a minute and open that up. And when you have it open, what you will see is all the information and resources we actually use to design and put together this webinar. Starting at the top, you'll see a link right to our science standards page. So many things we're gonna talk about today are on our website and that's the one click to get there. We also have a science resource page for a plethora of resources to help educators transition to the new science standards. And we also have up here the Science and STEM webinar registration. This is where you can click to register for all of our upcoming PD experiences. And so also, as we go through, you'll see that the resources are numbered on the left column. And we have some general resources here. So if you're looking for um, the slide deck, it's right here. We have a PDF version of the slides. You can click and have that. We also have this document called Webinar Pathways to help, you know, if you want to share it with educators to help them understand you know, if I want to take a webinar, what kind of webinar should I take? So that's just a useful tool. I, I recommend you look at that at some point. But what I want you to focus on is looking at the color coding scheme we have. There are some cells that have a white background and some cells that have a gray background. The gray background are ones we recommend clicking and opening and reading over that document. And we'll guide you throughout the webinar and say, open resource number two open resource number four. That way you have, it's a one-stop shop for all of our links. And that way we only have to give you this one link and the chat box does not get a little bit messy. So hopefully you have this up and ready to go. And reminder that gray means we will open and use it. If it's white, it's just a resource that helps us build this experience. Thank you. And with that folks, just remember it's a nice space to have everything in one spot instead of us trying to put in a bunch of different links in the chat for you. So today our goal is to provide administrators with guidance on really how to support educators in the classroom with the 2018 Arizona Science Standards with a focus on the three dimensions. Our other goal is to deepen our administrators understanding of the three dimensions and those shifts for students and teachers within these new standards. All right, here we have our, our standards implementation timeline. This is the implementation timeline that we have been on from year when the standards were first adopted in the fall of 2018. We are currently on a three-year implementation plan. This year, we are in year two. Our AIM science was canceled um, legislatively and the forms field test was given statewide. Next year, we'll be, we'll be in our third year of implementation and that is the year where we will also have the new Arizona science assessment. The assessment will be given in grade five on content covering from grades three, four and five. It will be given in eighth grade covering content from sixth, seventh and eighth. And again, it'll be given in high school and 11th grade covering the essential standards from grades nine, 10 and 11. This actual timeline is also in the dashboard on number two, if you wanted to go back and reference that. Also with the AZ Sci test for the assessment, there is this whole suite of resources that the assessment team has in the assessment website that you can go straight to, to learn more information about examples, models, what you need, or questions to ans be answered on the, about the assessment. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. And so as we start our learning today, I just want to ground us in why we are here, thinking about why we're here. And we are going to engage in this productive struggle together um, for a purpose. And our goal is to provide access to science literacy for all students. And our standards were actually developed from this very contemporary piece of research called the Framework for K-12 Science Education. 
And in this framework, this contemporary piece of research, it helps us understand how students learn science and helps educators ensure that we provide access to all learners to engage in science learning. And so to help us think about the shifts in instruction, I want to start off by talking about what we call the two labels for instruction. And so if you imagine these two labels that I'm going to describe as a spectrum, on one end of that spectrum, we have what is called the information frame. In this information frame that aligns with our old standards from 2004, that was the frame where the teacher is focused on providing and disseminating information. Students are focused on you know, absorbing and knowing that information. Science is really portrayed as a body of established facts and assessments were narrowly focused on just the right answers. And what we learned about this information frame is that what we were asking students to engage in was just in knowing about science through vocabulary and terms and sets of isolated facts that were not interconnected. And we are moving away from that style of instruction and we're moving towards a different end of that spectrum. This is called the sense-making frame. This is aligning with our new science standards and three-dimensional instruction, where the teacher is focused on developing conceptual understanding. The students are focused on understanding something and science is now portrayed as a way to make sense of the world around us. Assessments are going to look different because they are now gonna be focused on using evidence to support conclusions, claims, generalizations. It's not about multiple choice or just knowing vocabulary anymore. And the shift, if I could take away one message from this slide, is the shift is from knowing about science to putting the kids in the position of the scientist and the engineer to figure out the world around them. And so to help us understand and provide an, a foundational base for all of us to understand the shifts, we have this incredible tool that is um, in number four in your dashboard. And it's called a new vision for science education. It's a wonderful tool. And the way it's designed is you have this left column and the right column. And on the left column, this is what we're moving away from. Things like rote memorization of facts, learning ideas disconnected from questions, teachers providing information, teachers posing questions, worksheets, pre-planned outcomes. And we're moving towards putting students in the position of the engineers and the scientists and figuring out the world around them through the science and engineering practices. So I encourage you to open number four and go into what we call the alone zone, where you just take a moment and read through this document and really consider what are three to five things that resonate with you that are embedded in these shifts. And to move us forward, Here's a great visualization. We actually did that same activity, but instead of using um, just the document and talking about it, we had teachers create a word cloud to show the shifts in instruction. And on the left, it's a beautiful example of exactly what the shifts include. This, this is the old standards here, where we focused on just memorizing vocabulary and just science was all about terms oversimplifications, memorizing textbooks, one right answers, teacher-centered, teacher-led, teacher-provided, teacher, teacher, teacher is all over here, teacher-driven. Because what we're moving away from is this just the idea of learning about science in these terms and vocabulary, and we're shifting towards student-led investigations where they engage, they explore, they explain, it's driven by students, open-ended, modeling, investigating, exploring, arguing, where they are now in the position of the scientist and the engineer to figure out the world around them. And so let's do a side-by-side -side comparison of the 2004 old standards versus the 2018 new standards. So over here on the left, I pulled from a fourth grade standard uh, back from 2004, and here's performance objective two. Construct a series and parallel electric circuits. So when I read that, I want you, read it over and think about in your mind, like what does this look like in a classroom if students were meeting this performance objective? And what I see in my mind is the teacher provides a procedure, the students follow it step by step by step by step, they put together series, they put together parallel circuits and a light bulb goes on. But what it doesn't tell me 
is if the students have constructed their own knowledge that they can apply to a new situation regarding circuits. It does not help me understand as the educators if students understand how the energy transfers from one place to another in that circuit. It doesn't also help them apply if they want to troubleshoot what happens in a circuit when something goes wrong and the light bulb doesn't go on. And so that was a very narrow way of thinking. And here is the shift with the new standard. It's the same content. It's not like there's brand new science content. Electric circuits and electric currents are still there. And I can still use all those materials I have, but it's how we approach the students in our approach to learning and collabor collaborating with the students that is the shift. So what this style of standard looks like now is this develop and use a model that explains how the energy moved from place to place through electric circuits. And what I know about modeling, if I develop something, it is not a one and done thing. This is a one and done experience. To develop something means I'm gonna construct my own, uh, own ideas first. I'm gonna revise it after doing more learning. Then I'm gonna learn more. I'm gonna talk to my neighbors. I'm gonna collaborate with my team. We're going to put all our ideas together and we're going to develop the model over time. And then we're going to use that model to actually explain. Models should have explanatory power. And our model should explain how does that energy actually get from one place to another? What are the inputs in the system, the outputs of the system? Are there feedback loops? How does energy flow throughout the system to actually make it function? It's a much higher depth of knowledge to accomplish this standard and progress towards the standard than it was back in the 2004 standards. And so just a little bit of background of how our standards were developed. Our standards were developed using two pieces of research. The first here is called the framework for K-12 science education. And in here are the three dimensions, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. To note, the next generation science standards or the national set of standards are also built using this framework, similar to our Arizona science standards. So while we have a lot of things in common with the next generation science standards, we are not a full NGSS state. And the reason for that is because we added an additional research document called Working with Big Ideas of Science Education. This is the main reason we differ from the NGSS. So because we are not an NGSS state, we did not adopt the next generation science standards. We are called a framework based state because our standards were built upon the framework. And if you want to see more of these, we do have PDF versions. There are free versions and they are number five in the dashboard. And so let's dive into understanding what is this thing called three-dimensional science instruction and where does it come from? Well, it comes from the framework. And in here, if I were to open this text or I would look at the PDF, I would find in chapter three starts the first dimension, dimension one, the science and engineering practices. In chapter four is dimension two, the cross-cutting concepts. And in chapters five, six, and seven begin the content pieces, the core ideas of physical, life, earth, and space science. And so together, these make the three dimensions. And if you look at this visual of this pinwheel, on the outer portion in blue, we have the eight science and engineering practices. These are the tools for which students use to make sense of phenomena. So things like engaging in argument from evidence, constructing explanations, asking questions, developing and using models. All eight of these are what students do in the classroom actively to engage in making sense of phenomena. In the center, in the green section, we have what are called the seven cross-cutting concepts. These are lenses through which students think about phenomena and are tools we provide to the students to help them gather more evidence. Things like cause and effect, looking at patterns and data, structure and function, systems and system models. And finally, in the center, which is nothing new, these are the content pieces, the core ideas, the very large ideas in science that will spiral throughout the grade levels from K through 12 that really um, have students engage in content and core ideas around physical, life, earth, and space science. 
And so if you look at your dashboard, this is number six. I'm going to ask that you open it because in just a minute on the next slide, we're going to watch a video that really helps you understand what are these three dimensions? What are the shifts in instruction? And to help you kind of guide your thinking as you watch the video, this is a great tool to have out. This is called the AZSS Snapshot, and it really is all of our three dimensions on one place, kind of like a place map. And so as an educator, when I sit down to plan something, this is the tool I take out. As an administrator, maybe when I walk into a classroom, this might be a great tool to have out to kind of look and see if you can see the three dimensions actually occurring within the classroom. So up here, you have dimension one, over here, dimension two, and down here, these two boxes combined for dimension three. And we'll talk about this a little later after we watch the video. And so we are gonna spend time watching this video. And if this is something you would like to share with educators in your district, we do provide the video in number seven in the dashboard. And what this is, is it's called NGSS, a vision for K-12 science education. And I know I said we're not an NGSS state, but because we were also built our standards on the framework, this video correlates perfectly to our new standards. And it's gonna really help you understand what are these things called three-dimensional instruction and how do you combine them together? And so as you watch the video, just think about maybe one or two of these questions. How do our standards represent a shift in science education? What do the teachers in this video learn from engaging in this style of instruction? How do those three dimensions work together? So I'm gonna just grab the video and I'll start it. When we learn things, it isn't for memorizing a piece of information. Just reciting science facts or principles is not what we want children to be able to do. We want them to be able to go out in the world and make sense of novel phenomena. So making sense of things really is engaging in a performance and saying, I need to construct an explanation of why or how this occurs. Okay, let's get started. Are you ready? 56. Throughout the three days, I want you to engage as the scientist, you as the student, you as the learner. If it was room temperature water, would it be behaving in the same way? What's the science behind this? What's happening? As teachers start focusing on the next generation science standards, they will be able to help students see science as it really is, that it's not just a set of steps and procedures. The real hope is that they can make a connection between what we do in the modeling of performances of science and what they do in their classroom. Oh, wow. In this day and age, one of the factors influencing the next generation science standards is the globalization, understanding we're in a global community. We're not kind of an isolated entity here. The next generation science standards takes the vision from the framework for K-12 science education and puts it into a set of performance expectations. And it calls for the students to actively engage in science. It sets out parameters for science education, clear goals, along with describing the three dimensions that students can engage in to make sense of science. Three dimensions are the cross-cutting concepts, the science and engineering practices, and the disciplinary core ideas. Most of those ideas are not new. The integration of them, pulling those three dimensions together, is new. If we're going to have the kids doing that, instruction has to reflect that. What I'm walking away from today, kind of a big shift for me is, we can focus in on something very specific to help teach a much broader, bigger idea, that it actually helps the students be able to do that application to new scenarios, new situations. Cross-cutting concepts. There's seven of them. And the way we've organized them is around causality, structure and function, systems, scale and proportion, change and stability, matter and energy, and then the last thing, pattern. These cross-cutting concepts are tools that you provide to the children, and they use those tools to make sense of phenomena. So we're looking for changes in the system. There's condensation on the outside. The cross-cutting concepts are a way of organizing the phenomena in terms of what the system is that's being studied. What did you define as your system? 
We included in our system also the surrounding air. The idea that there's a cause-effect relationship. What's causing the cloudiness? That's causing the bubbles to come off in the air. It's going to get pushed in the direction of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, patterns used as evidence to support their explanations. So to me, the pattern is just the fluttering back and forth, right? Do you have a question in mind? Why that pattern, that the back, back and, and forth. forth pattern? What yeah. if we change the direction of the flag if we turn it this way? Okay. I want to go inside and make a little paper flag that we can blow on and manipulate. The practices are a set of things that children do in engaging in science performances. Asking questions right here, that's what students do. As a professional teacher, you have to create an environment in which students are asking questions to help them make sense of things. Ready? 150. Why doesn't that ball return to that exact same level that you dropped it? Engaging students in the practices really does pique their curiosity, and it helps them have a desire to go out and have more questions about the world, which asking questions is a practice. So it's something we want them to be able to do and be able to discover more about the world. What else contributes to it not reaching its maximum height that it started at? The pull of gravity. Gravity's still pulling it back down even though it's bouncing up. As learners, using evidence and using that evidence to construct explanations is important. I think having those experiences will really help students own the content. So more bounce, yeah. more energy in the bounce, right. and that's really the kinetic energy. The last dimension of the core idea, is, and there's nothing new here, we don't want kids at the end of instruction to recite the core ideas. We want them to use them in science performances to make sense of novel phenomena, applying them to construct exclamations and develop arguments. So the alcohol is less dense than the ice, as you can see. The density in there is different. Oh, yeah. The core ideas in particular become valuable because we revisit them through every grade band, and they're moving forward in a very logical way. Those things we're asking them to do can be applied to more than just alcohol and water. It can be applied to cloud formation. It can be applied to condensation. Why? What's happening? I think what's exciting about the Next Generation Science Standards is this intersection of the three dimensions and that we're not just working on practices one day. You really are infusing the three dimensions within the classroom. One of the things that you've done is ask what if. By doing that, I have to be able to take what I know, what I've learned, looking at the models, looking at patterns, and applying them somehow to show that I understand what would happen if I changed a dynamic. It's been real helpful to remember that, you know, I can't do one without thinking about the other. No change, we should add that, right? That's how students are gonna be thinking about them as well. It's cute. It's my hope that this will be the reform in science education that not only gets students more proficient in science, but builds interest in science. All right, so we'll come on back to the presentation. Oops. All right. And so hopefully in viewing that video, you learned a little bit more about the three dimensions and how they work together. And let's just review how our three dimensions work in Arizona. Ours are just slightly different from the next generation science standards. So I just wanted to walk you through using this really useful tool. So up here, we have dimension one, the practices, what students do to make sense of that phenomena. Over here, we have dimension two, the cross-cutting concepts. Um, which are the lenses through which students think and can gather more evidence about phenomena. But down here, this is where we're a little bit different from the next generation science standards and the way we organized our core ideas. On the left here, you'll see we have 10 core ideas of what we call knowing science. This is content, very large ideas in science that'll be spiraled over the grade bands to help students really have a deep understanding over time. So physical science, earth and space, and life. And then over here in the purple box, we have three core ideas of what we call using science, U1, U2, and U3. U1 really focuses on using phenomena and engaging in the practices to make sense of the world around us. 
and most of our standards are U1. U2 is when we engage in the engineering design process and try to define a problem and create a solution, maybe a product. And U3 is where we apply. We take the phenomena or the engineering problem, and then we, after we figure things out, we apply it and look at implications in the real world. And so here are our three dimensions in Arizona. Great, Rebecca, can we go back real quick? I wanna just call out one thing on that slide. If you'll notice here, there's also, there are also page numbers that are with each of those dimensions that are called out. So if you're wondering what those are, those are exactly from the framework if you wanted to go look up those specific pieces. And this is also a really good tool if you sat down and you're planning with a teacher or a teacher is planning together in their PLCs to think about, okay, what SEP am I bringing in here? What are the students doing? And then, okay, what lens do I really want them to think through? Highlight that, call it out. And then what is that core idea that they're really focusing in on? Thank you, Rebecca. Perfect, thank you, Sarah. And so as you heard in that video, and as Sarah just mentioned, like when we sit down to plan as educators, we really need to be thinking about these three dimensions. And that is gonna be a big shift for some educators in Arizona, because what we're used to uh, coming from the old standards from 2004 was really teaching science according to the scientific method, which is not in alignment with the new standards and practices and the three dimensions. And so to help us understand why we should move away from the step-by-step -step linear one way of thinking process of the scientific method, we have this great video that we're just gonna show you a little bit of about, a, about two minutes of this video. It's gonna help you understand as an administrator why we should not be seeing scientific method in the classroom right now in the essence to align with our new standards. So let me grab the video, here it is. A couple years ago, a group of citizen scientists for the Western Cave Conservancy discovered a large, odd-looking spider in a cave in Southern Oregon. They sent it to scientists in California. Recently, those scientists declared that spider a new species, Trogoraptor, and a member of a new family of spiders. Sounds straightforward, right? Wrong. Science definitely is not a linear step-by-step -step fashion. And science is unpredictable. It's uh, dynamic. And I don't think it ever concludes. It just keeps going. To communicate the real process of science, Judy and her colleagues developed this science flowchart to better explain how science works. You may start in one area and you find the need to communicate with the community of scientists that you work with who might have additional or other ideas and all of that helps to shape what science is and how we go about the process of science. So let's take a look at the Trogloraptor discovery flowchart. It's less like a linear process and more like a pinball machine. Let's follow the path using the spider that the citizen scientists found as the pinball. They sent it to scientist Tracy Audizio who is very curious about what lives in caves. She examined it for about two hours one night, trying to identify it by making observations and conferring with a colleague. They were stumped. The two researchers worked with the Academy's Charles Griswold and brought the specimen to him. He began his own observations. I looked at it through the vial, uh, not under a microscope, and I thought, oh, this is a brown recluse. It's about the same size, but when I looked at it closely, all the brown recluse characters, that is, the various details of its anatomy, were wrong. Yeah. All right, we're going to stop here, mainly because we've already seen the portion of the video that really talks about how this linear process of scientific method, where we start with a research question, hypothesis, etc., is really not how scientists engage. So if you wanna watch the rest of it, it is available in number eight in the dashboard and it just continues to explain, you know, how, how does that pinball sort of dynamic approach to science actually work? And to further help us explore, we are going to move on in the presentation because this is where we want to focus on. 
And what this is, is we have these great resources called STEM teaching tools. And if you look up here, there's a whole website of these amazing resources. And we're particularly going to use two of these today. The first one is STEM teaching tools number 32. And this one is why should we focus on science and engineering practices and not inquiry? Why is the scientific method mistaken? And so there is a PDF of this entire tool. It is available at number nine in the dashboard. But I, I want you to just take a moment and read over this quote from page two of the PDF. And so our message to administrators is the scientific method is, is a myth. It's been perpetuated to this day by many textbooks. This is not a linear process. This will not align to our new standards and a three-dimensional approach to sense-making in the classroom. And so we just wanna keep in mind that we are this is going to take time for educators to understand and transition towards them. So as administrators, think about how you can best support that transition. And in line with that, how else do we transition in the spirit and the essence of the new standards and a sense-making approach is another great STEM teaching tool, number 46. This STEM teaching tool is available as a PDF. It is number 10 in your dashboard. And I highly recommend reading it because it talks about how do we define meaningful daily learning objectives for science investigations? And so why is this an issue? Well, you may be thinking to yourself as an administrator, do I have my educators place objectives on the board? Is that a mandated requirement? And if so, you need to consider what needs to go on the board and how it aligns to this new approach to three-dimensional teaching. So I'm gonna read this quote, which comes from this document. What is the issue? Well, many schools require teachers to post the day's learning target, objective, or standard on the board. However, displaying that target concept to be learned, the disciplinary core idea that is the focus of instruction actually gives away what the students should be figuring out as they make sense of phenomena by engaging in the science and engineering practices. Many teachers do face a dilemma when they try to meet their administrators' requirements. It is important for teachers and administrators to come to consensus around developing and using objectives that are consistent with 3D learning. And so keeping this in mind, we do not want students to know what they're gonna figure out. That means they're not figuring it out. You already told them. That is not aligned with best practice in the approach to transitioning to our new standards. So, if this is something your district requires or your school requires, I want you to think a little bit about how could we restructure, rethink, reimagine those learning objectives on the board if that is a mandate. One tool to help you understand what teachers could use to help provide classroom objectives that are mandated to be put on the board without giving it away to students. We have tools to help you think through this and educators think through this while planning. The first, and this is located on our website and in the dashboard in number 11, we have these incredible vertical progressions for the science and engineering practices. Remember there are eight science and engineering practices and I just grabbed a screenshot from one of them, developing and using models. And what you see here are practices with these bullets for K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12. And so, these are targeted things that students in these grade levels should be you know, engaging with to understand and use that practice. They increase in sophistication over time. So each of these bullets is actually called an element. And each element is a specific piece of knowledge and skill that make up the practice. And so if you're wondering where we can get objectives, classroom objectives that could be put on the board that do not give it away, these are great tools for that. So look at this, develop a model using an analogy example or abstract representation to describe a scientific principle or design solution. I'm not telling the students what they're gonna figure out. 
I'm explaining what they're going to do to make sense of the phenomena. Remember the practices are what we do to make sense. That is one option. Another option is we do have the same style of document for the cross-cutting concepts, which is the second dimension. So there are seven of these, and we have these progressions, K through 12, increasing in sophistication, similar to the last document, for all seven of the cross-cutting concepts. So here you see number one, we have patterns and cause and effect. This is located on our website and in the dashboard at number 12. And again, each of these bullets or elements can be used as a classroom objective, but definitely should be used in planning. These parts and pieces should be incorporated into learning sequences when sitting down to plan lessons. So things like patterns can be used as evidence to support an explanation. I didn't give it away. The students know that they're gonna use, it's a tool. They're gonna use patterns to gather evidence to support an explanation not giving away what they're trying to figure out. That is what we want to move away from. And so to help you as an administrator better support educators transitioning to this new style of three-dimensional instruction, we've developed this really great tool called What to Look For in a Three-Dimensional Science Classroom, Guidance for Administrators. This is number 13 in the dashboard. And this screenshot is just a one pager, talks about how to use this document. We have identified three major look fors. Look for one is regarding sense making. Look for two is about making thinking visible. And look for three is about engaging all students equitably in our science classrooms. And how do you use this document? Well, this is not intended to be used as an observation checklist. Instead, it can serve as a tool that describes what it might look like as science teaching and learning shifts to align with the new Arizona Science Standards best practices. This tool is not intended to be used as an evaluative tool, but rather to help you gain insight into the effectiveness of instructional practices for engaging students in three-dimensional science learning. And so let's take a more granular look at each of these look fors one by one in the next slides. First, let's start off with look for one, and I'm going to invite you to read the content in this box up here. And so to review this, this is about sense making, that sense making frame of instruction where we engage students in a phenomena, naturally occurring event that happens in the real world that we have to figure out what is causing that thing to happen. Those things are called phenomena. And so down here, we have a couple examples of phenomena, very simple ideas that are caused by something that we need to figure out what's causing it to happen. Something like big waves move more sand from beaches than little waves. Something is causing that to happen and we can figure it out. Same with this one, sailboats move when the wind blows. Something is causing the, the sailboat to move and we can try to figure that out. Another example, leaves are darker on the top as compared to the underside. That's a naturally occurring phenomena. There's a reason for it. We can try to figure it out. And so if you um, focus your attention down here on the right-hand corner, what this means is we're actually going to have to flip our instruction upside down. When we talked about the scientific method, we talked about the old standards, very low depth of knowledge um, incorporated in those performance objectives. When we were engaging students in that way of doing science, it was this one-way street where scientists and teachers were the knowers of science and some students walked away with learning some stuff about science. However, it didn't reach all students. When we just asked students to understand vocabulary and terms and isolated facts that are not interconnected and don't apply to our lives, that is not how we reach all students. But if we can flip our instruction upside down, put the students in the position of the scientists and the engineer, ask them to make science or make sense of the science phenomena with teachers as the guide doing some of the heavy lifting, 
and all, all the students doing heavy lifting as well. This is how we're going to shift instruction by flipping it upside down. For look for two, I'm going to invite you to read over this box at the top. Look for two, making thinking visible, using models, explanations, arguments that best fit the evidence available at the time. When we engage students in sense-making, they need opportunities to construct their own knowledge. This is a constructivist approach where they commit to their own thinking first about what's happening in that phenomena. And then they share with their team or collaborate in a group. But we have to provide sense-making opportunity first for students to commit to their own thinking. And we do that through providing notebooks, structured notebooks. We do that providing space for modeling and explanations. And we do that by providing them an opportunity to make initial ideas and then revise them over time to create final ideas or final models. And finally, look for three, engaging all students equitably in a science community and culture that values all ideas and voices. I will invite you to read this top portion. All of this has to do with establishing a community and culture that values all students' ideas. We want to see less teacher, student, 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 teacher talking. We want to see students talking more than just the teacher talking. So normally we would have teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher. We do not want to see that anymore. We want to move away from that. We want to see students collaborating. Collaborate, uh, sorry, collaborating on ideas, agreeing, disagreeing, adding on, connecting to each other's ideas. And how do we engage students in this science talk? Well, there's some tools for that. Things like creating shared agreements or norms. So everybody knows the rights and responsibilities that every individual brings to that classroom community. Things like dialogue protocols, carefully structured groups, and making sure there's a product or accountability for our thinking. And one great tool to help with this productive talk is this productive talk checklist. These are called the nine talk moves. How do kids, you know, paraphrase, share ideas, revise ideas, agree and disagree? This is number 14 in the dashboard. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah to kind of close us up. Great, thank you, Rebecca. So I want to showcase, first of all, before we go back through our goals, the tools that we have available for you on our science standards webpage. We have the administrator toolkit on there with a lot of the resources. All of these resources are in your actual dashboard at this point, but these are some of the main resources that we have available all of the time. Like we said earlier, that snapshot for educators and administrators is a really nice tool to pull out in the planning process. And we also have that uh, the three dimensional look for's list right there as well for um, administrators to use as a guide, not an evaluative tool, but just a guide of what will you see students doing in the classroom and what should you probably see educators doing in the classroom to move to that three dimensional and that shift of approach to teaching and learning. On the right hand side, we also have all of our learning opportunities available. We have live webinars that happen throughout the month, but we also have them all recorded in their own little suite as a resource for as a resource for educators or administrators to go in to be more comfortable and get to know the new standards. So we have everything from look at the new standards, what are they? Tell me a little bit more to using each of the um, dimensions, the cross-cutting concepts, the science and energy practices, the core ideas. There's one on pulling all of those together. There's also one on instructional approaches that you can go to to support three-dimensional learning as well. All right, you wanna go to the next? So today we had some goals and I wanna appreciate Rebecca for driving the bus and taking us through that learning experience today. We wanted you to walk away as administrators just with tools to help support those educators in that science classroom when you walk in and science is on taking place. 
We also wanted to give you a deeper understanding of those new shifts for our science education that are embedded to those new standards, because it is a, it is a quite a shift of that teaching and learning style. So thank you, Rebecca, for taking us through and driving the bus for us today on that learning. Um, we do have time for, you know, in this session here today, we'll, we will pop, well, the video will close and then we'll do an open opportunity for questions and, you know, we'll do the best we can answer for you to ask questions, we'll do the best we can to answer them. We are always available, so you can email either of us. We're here to support you with the implementation of the new standards. It is a shift, so please reach out if you need support in different areas or some ideas. Um, we do meet with different districts and different educators regularly. So thank you for being in here today and we will move over to the question space next. All right, thank you everyone. Honored to share this space with you.